Hey, welcome back. Today let's pick up from where we left off on. The Limited Time Princess Chapter 5 We continue the story with a stern-looking Marion telling Princess Shalia that they can't go outside of the castle unsupervised. It's too dangerous. You were just lost yesterday, princess, she says. The princess pleads with puppy dog eyes. She only wants to spend some time outside with Marion, she says in the sweetest way possible. It's dangerous, princess. Oh, please, Marion. They continue their back and forth while the other maids look on with confusion. It is a bright sunny morning, the birds are chirping. We see an excited Princess Shalia looking at the new surroundings with wide eyes. Marion is standing right beside the princess, her face dark and defeated. It seems the princess won their battle of the wits. The capital is a bustling and crowded place with people going about their daily lives. The princess gives a triumphant giggle, as she recalls how easy it was to get out of the castle. Something she can easily do again, once she needs to leave in the future. The princess excitedly runs off with Marion calling her from behind, but unbeknownst to them a hooded figure is watching them from the shadows. As the princess and Marion walk around the crowded main road, a worried Marion suggests that they return to the carriage. But the princess is unrelentless and with an excited giggle, declares that the crowd doesn't bother her and that the market is lovely. She wants to see how people live in this world. It all looks different, but at the same time familiar to her. Suddenly she notices two women chatting by a stall. The two women are talking about a specific type of hair dye that can turn your hair crimson for a month with only a few drops. Only a few drops to dye my hair, that's the dream. The two women continue that neither of them are royalty and so they have no use for such products. As Princess Shalia watches the two women, Marion looks at the princess with a worried look on her face. With a blank expression on her face, the princess gets lost in her thoughts. The goddess Isonia had crimson red hair and golden eyes. Both of these features are well loved and praised by her worshippers. Isonia's golden eyes was a trait her descendants in the imperial family had, but over the generations dwindled and ultimately disappeared. This is why Eclet, with her crimson hair and golden eyes is the perfect proof of the goddess blood. While crimson hair is more common now, even one of her maids has it, the combination of red hair and golden eyes is still very rare and special. Princess Marion breaks the princess train of thought. Marion is clearly worried over the princess getting lost in thoughts of not having red hair, and so she suggests they go out and explore the market some more. The princess blushes with excitement that now Marion is the one suggesting they explore. And so the two continue to explore for hours until sunset. Tired and spent, the princess walks sluggishly. Marion offers to carry her but she declines. She mentally reminds herself that she needs more exercise and to get into shape. Girl, me too. In the meantime, the princess rests by the bench while Marion calls for the carriage to take them back to the castle. Resting her feet, now the princess is more relaxed. She releases a sigh of relief and notes that the capital is pretty big. In the future, in case she needs to hide, she won't need to go far. Now all she needs is some backup money. Suddenly she hears a shout from a distance. Help! A little boy, wearing a hooded cloak, runs to her in panic. His grandmother had just fainted, and he didn't know what to do. Without a second thought, the princess gets up from the bench to follow the child. They both run towards an abandoned alley, under the bridge. The princess rushes in but inside sees no grandmother instead only sees two adult men. The two men look at her with satisfied expressions on their faces, as they announce that she took their bait. The princess is speechless, too stunned to speak. One of the men yanks the child, and praises the young boy for doing a good job and luring three unsuspecting victims for the day. He announces that the boy's share will be given to him later. Now the men turn their attention to the princess. With a mischievous grin, one of them explained that they are not bad people. Since she looks like a rich woman, they are merely asking for a small donation such as her valuables while they giggle. The princess seeing all this unfold realizes that she was tricked, and fell into a trap. 
while she feels betrayal over what the child did. She tells herself that it's not the child's fault but the adults who are taking advantage of him. In a normal novel, if she was the heroine, this would be the moment when the knight in shining armor would come and save her. In reality, however, she is the villainess in the novel. There is no knight that will come to save her. She tells herself she needs to exercise so she can defend herself next time. Suddenly the young child speaks. Nervously, he says that neither of the men gave him anything yet for luring all those unsuspecting victims. He says he was promised money, but was only ever given scraps of bread. The men are surprised the child talked back at them and reminds the boy to know his place in life. One of the men reaches out for his hood and reveals a little boy with white hair and striking red eyes. Seeing the boy's features, the princess is stunned. She recalls having seen this before. In the novel, Princess Shalia is standing proudly over the young boy. She repeats that her order was clear. She looks at the boy on the ground, eyes full of hatred and contempt. Garbage, she calls him. The guards look over at her, asking for her order, then she gives it. Princess Shalia demands that the same young boy be executed. This recollection from the novel shakes the current princess. This particular scene is how her character was introduced in the novel. It showed that she was truly such a despicable monster. The boy in front of her was a minor character that existed only to be killed by Princess Shalia. But something was wrong, this shouldn't be happening yet? What is going on? Okay, first of all, as a modern age woman, shouldn't Shalia know better than to follow strange kids into an abandoned alley? You are a 21st century woman that lived in South Korea, girl. Anyway. Chapter 6 When Goddess Isonia cleansed the lands, the defeated demons fled to the plains of annihilation. In this place were also exiled sinners, whose life now became hell. Despite this, however, a resilient group of people were able to survive their hellish conditions. These people with white hair and red eyes were called the crones. Theirs is a small group of people held in contempt and hatred by everyone. Despite this troubling backstory, there was only one crone that appeared in the novel, this young boy destined to die by Shalia's hands. But what's curious is that this event was meant to happen weeks in the future during the flower festival, after Eclet had already entered the story. Confused at what's happening, Shalia continues that she wanted to escape the castle even before she met Eclet. From the start, her plan was to avoid all the main characters of the story, but what if she can't avoid them after all? Her head is swirling with so many questions about Eclet and the young boy, when one of the men suddenly shouts accusing her of ignoring them. Shalia is startled as this man shouts at her demanding for her valuables. In her head, Shalia can only pray that Marion will find her. Back at the castle we see Grace talking to maids Anne and Susan asking where the princess and Marion went. The two maids stutter and Anne, the red-haired maid, explains that Marion accompanied the princess all by herself. Worriedly, she explains that it was a demand given by the princess herself. Grace gives out a sigh, she tells the maids not to worry and that she is positive Marion wouldn't go out unprepared. Back to the alley, we see Marion had just returned. She calmly steps towards the princess and expresses apologies for being late. The two men are confused at who this person is, but unwilling to back down. One of them proudly demands Marion for her valuables as well. Marion cuts the man off mid-sentence. With closed eyes she calmly tells the princess that preparations are complete for their return to the castle. Just then several armed guards appear from the shadows, surrounding them. Seeing this, the two men now flinch, their faces worried. Marion proceeds to ask the princess what her orders are and princess replies calmly and absolute, make them kneel. We now see the two men kneeling on the floor, with a guard standing over them reprimanding them. The royal guards will arrive soon to take care of them. Meanwhile, a worried Marion asks the princess whether she sustained any injuries or not, and the princess tells her to calm down since she is fine. One of the guards approaches the princess asking what to do about the crone child. The child lied about having any family, and he doesn't have a home either. The guard asks if the child should be sent to prison with the other men as well, 
to which the princess shows annoyance at his question. It is now night time and we are back in the castle. The princess is sitting from across the young boy, in the drawing room. The child is looking at the floor, clearly uncomfortable. The princess thinks to herself and what she should do. Though this boy was killed by Shalia in the novels, that is something she could never do, so she brought him to the castle with her instead. The child breaks the silence by asking where he was. Trembling with fear, he asks if he will be sent to jail or executed. The princess is taken aback by his words, offended that he would think that. She explains that she is not that kind of person and she knows he had limited options in life. To boy's stomach grumbles, and the princess proceeds to ask what his name was. He answers that his name is Riven and that he doesn't know his surname. The princess smiles to herself, she is glad that a character that only existed to be executed also had a name. She introduces herself and leaves out that she is the princess. She calls for Anne and asks her to have the boy cleaned and fed. Together, Anne and the boy leave the princess alone in the room to her thoughts. The princess goes over what transpired that day. The boy was meant to die in the novel, so changing his path now is a good chance to see what will happen to characters who stray from their story. On the extreme side, what if the boy will still die eventually in the castle, and that she will get blamed for it, and so becomes the villain regardless? She shivers at the thought when suddenly she hears a loud shriek from the room outside. The princess and Marion both rush outside to where the shriek came from, and they see and on the floor. And looks at the princess with a confused expression on her face as she explains what happened. The little boy suddenly got big. She says, I'm glad that Marion came just in time, but where was she hiding all those guards? Were they just chilling by the carriage playing cards? I mean they could have hid behind a tree. While the princess and Marion explored, right. But phew, the ending was a twist. Let's see what happens next. Chapter 7 The next morning, Grace and Marion are in the princess's study. Grace is trying to convince the princess that bringing the crone to the castle is a bad idea. The princess is casually reading a book, looking very relaxed. She tells Grace that he is just one more person in the castle so it's not a big deal. Taken aback, Grace continues. He will bring bad luck and curse upon you princess. She says that had it not been for goddess Isonia's magical spell on the castle, the crone's magical disguise would not have been broken. She ends her speech by suggesting the crone be handed over to the palace guards, if not he might bring them a scandal. The princess clenches her fist. Why must she be in a scandal when she only wanted to help a child? She realizes that crones are treated worse than she initially thought. Grace looks over at Marion, beckoning her to convince the princess. Grace lightheartedly says that the boy seems pretty harmless and calmly continues, I will support the princess in whatever she desires. The princess is touched. She recalls that Marion was taken in by her mother. Marion was only a child back then and she followed her mother all the way into the castle. The princess ends the conversation by announcing that she has already made up her mind. She has shown him benevolence that he wouldn't dare refuse. Unable to disagree, Grace supports the princess's decision. Just then, there is a knock on the door. Susan enters the room and announces that the crone, their guest, has finally awoken. We see a fully grown Riven sitting up on the bed with groggy eyes. He had just woken up and is still getting his bearings. He blushes and pats at the soft bedding and notices his hand is bigger. He has already returned to his original form. Suddenly Riven hears footsteps coming from the hallway. The doors creak open and the princess with Marion enters the room. Marion announces the princess's arrival. She reminds Riven to stand up and show respect to the princess. Did you sleep well? The princess asks. Upon hearing this, Riven is stunned. He didn't know she was the princess. He immediately tries to get up from bed but is stopped by Shalia. She tells him that from now on he will be staying by her side. Riven and Marion are both shocked by the princess's words. The princess clarifies that she wants Riven to work as a member of her staff in the castle. 
Riven is unsure because of his origins as a crone but the princess reassures him and says that it's not a problem for her. She asks how Riven was able to turn into a child. Do you know magic? Riven responds that he is ordinary. Back in the exiled lands at a slave market, a woman cast a spell on him that turned him into a child. The woman said that as a child it would be easier for him to escape and that people will be kinder to a child. Riven adds that the spell never wore off for the longest time. Confused, the princess asks what happened to the woman. Riven clasping his hands, responds that he doesn't know. The woman is probably dead. The princess' face darkens, unable to respond. She didn't know this was happening in the novel. She couldn't do anything about it. Calmly she assures Riven that everything will be okay. He no longer has to worry. From now on she will take care of Riven. He was a disposable character, but not anymore. She knows the destiny of the other characters, but Riven's fate is unknown. She smiles to herself, she will help him grow like in a video game. Maybe he will become an incredible person. She giggles to herself while Riven watches her confused. She suggests they get something to eat and both of them walk outside the room. She says that she will introduce Riven to the others after their meal. The staff might be wary, but they all mean well. She peeks at Riven walking behind her. She asks him if he has any injuries. She will need to call the palace doctor just in case. Riven stops walking, his face filled with insecurity. He responds that he has no injuries, but is worried that he won't be much help. He doesn't have an education. In the middle of Riven words, suddenly from above him the chandelier creaks and loosens. The metal support fails and snaps. The heavy chandelier free falls to the ground. The princess sees the chandelier about to fall on Riven then there's a crash. Pieces of metal and glass scatter on the floor as pool of blood forms. Oh no, what just happened? I hope this isn't going to be like Final Destination, but I have to say it's nice how the princess is decisive and doesn't get swayed by superstitions. Anyway... Chapter 8 The princess and Riven are both on the ground having just missed the chandelier. Shalia upon seeing the chandeliers, lunges and pushes Riven out of the way. In the process she injures her leg. Her face filled with concern asks Riven if he's was hurt in any way. Riven is shocked and answers that he is okay. He points out the injury on the princess's leg. She forces a smile and says it's only a small cut, she turns to look for her shoe but gets lightheaded. Her vision blurs and she passes out on the floor. In a flashback we see Marion brushing the princess's hair. The princess is lost in her thoughts again. She wonders what happened to her original body. That body must have died, that's why she was able to become Shalia. But what if something happens to her as Shalia? Would she just die as her? If that's the case she wants to die as Shalia, at least as Shalia people will be worried about her. In the present Shalia finally opens her eyes and sees her maid's faces filled with concern. Marion announces that the princess is awake and immediately calls upon the palace doctor. The doctor arrives and reassures that there is no need to worry as the princess only fainted due to shock. There will be a huge scar on her leg however. He flatly says that while it's fortunate her face wasn't injured, the scar on her leg may affect her marriage. Marion looks at Dr. Mason stunned. Then she lashes out at him and angrily says that he must have a lot of lives to be speaking this way to the princess. While they argue the princess sits on her bed. She touches the scar on her leg. She feels apologetic for injuring a body that isn't hers, but is still glad she saved a life. She remembers Riven and immediately asks Marion where the man was. After the princess fainted, Riven was immediately sent to the castle's dungeon. The princess shouts that Riven didn't do anything wrong, why did they do that? Dr. Mason speaks, because of him you got injured princess. He must be put to death whether intentional or not. The princess looks at the doctor, speechless. The man continues his concerns about the crone. It's curious how the chandelier suddenly fell during that moment and it had been fine for hundreds of years. Perhaps there might be some truth to crones and the misfortunes they bring. 
The princess angrily responds that a doctor should believe in logic and reason. She announces that she has heard enough and calls for Riven to be brought to her. She ends the discussion by stating that she is the only one logical and reasonable. She will claim her reward for saving his life. Marion and Dr. Mason agrees with the princess's words. Outside the room, Riven has arrived from the dungeons. He hesitates to enter the room. His heart beats on his chest, his thoughts clouding his head. Perhaps the princess is holding a grudge against me. Riven slowly opens the door to the princess bedroom. Sunlight beams from the room and we see a relaxed princess lying on the bed reading a book. Her legs raised in the air casually. She happily beckons him to enter and explains that she didn't know he was sent to the dungeon. She apologizes for not getting him out sooner. Riven solemnly looks at the princess's leg and asks if she's alright. The princess calmly assures him that it's merely a small sprain. That's hardly called a sprain, Shalia. But I guess you didn't want him to worry. She continues that until her leg heals, would Riven mind and continue to stay and run errands for her? Riven is surprised the princess even asked this. He feels bad that the princess got hurt because of him. Clenching his fist, he questions the princess, but you got hurt because of me. The princess replies that it was an accident and that it's not his fault. She brightly smiles at him and continues, were you planning on running away, leaving me here injured? Riven is stunned at the princess's words. The maids looking over are watching with different expressions on their faces. Grace can only sigh at the princess's decision, but the rest gave smiles, proud of their princess. Riven accepts Shalia's invitation to stay. And smiles, announcing that he would like to continue to stay. It is now night time in the castle. Marion is reporting to the princess that they have completed her orders. Riven was given a room with plenty of sunlight, but that he doesn't have an education and therefore, doesn't know how to read and write. The princess was expecting this. She considers if the maids can teach Riven, but they are always busy with their tasks. Perhaps the doctor, but he might only experiment on Riven. Thus the princess concludes that she will be the one to teach Riven instead. As if on cue, a knock comes from the door. Riven, now wearing his staff uniform, enters the room. He apologizes for intruding, but he was ordered by Grace to see the princess. The princess is impressed by how Riven looks. The uniform suits him well. Thank you princess, Riven responds. Marion looks on face beaming with pride. The princess smiles at Riven and announces that she will depend on him from now on. The next day, we see Tezric in his family mansion. Rumors have been swirling around him that the princess has taken an unknown crone in. This along with the fact that her engagement with Tezric ended is all too suspicious. Tezric sets his teacup on the table with a loud clink. He sighs, clearly uncomfortable with all the rumors. He wonders where the rumors are coming from. Their engagement wasn't ended, it was merely on hold. Then he recalls his meeting with the princess. I've met someone I love. Remembering these words, Tezric stands up from his table and leaves in a hurry. Who drama is a love triangle brewing. I know Tezric is the original novel's main hero, but he has a pretty big ego which is such a turn off. You know what they say about men with big egos. Anyway. Chapter 9 Back in the princess's castle, Marion informs the princess that Tezric had just arrived. Confused, the princess wonders what he is doing there so early in the morning. Marion clarifies what she should do, and the princess responds that her neck feels empty and that hopefully he didn't come empty-handed. We see Marion now talking to Tezric, repeating the princess's very words. Tezric can only sit unhappy. He was offered tea so at least he's not fully rejected. As he sips his tea he begins to ask Marion something, but stops himself. He reminds himself that he is a man of name and honor and that he can do better than this. He didn't come there just for some tea. He puts his teacup down and... Crash. A loud crash is heard. Curious, Tezric asks if that was him, he didn't set his teacup down that hard. Marion is embarrassed and explains that the sound came from the kitchens. They are encountering issues there recently. 
he releases a sigh of relief. He announces that he has other matters to attend to, when he notices a man walking outside in the garden. With wide eyes, Tezric watches the man and notes his white hair. The man outside turns around, and Tezric sees his bright red eyes. It's the crone from the rumors. Tezric gets up from his seat and looks out the window. He sighs and immediately turns around to leave the room, informing Marion he will be on his way. Lost in his thoughts he wonders how much truth is there in all the swirling rumors. In the kitchen we see chaos. Pots and pans have exploded and Anne and Susan are arguing in panic. Both have no idea why the kitchen tools are suddenly not working as intended. Riven slides in the room and politely states that he has already finished his tasks and asks if they have any more for him to do. And giggles and tells him that there's nothing else for him to do, and that it's time for his lessons already so he's dismissed. Susan watches them, her face wary and unsure. After Riven leaves the room, Susan speaks out. She thinks it's suspicious how bizarre things started happening as soon as Riven arrived. Plates are forming cracks, new brooms are falling apart, even earlier the pots and pans exploded. And has a quizzical look on her face, don't those things happen from time to time anyway? And continues that Riven isn't even directly causing the explosions, and regardless the princess already decided that Riven will stay. Susan continues to express her worries but Grace loudly reminds them to continue their tasks. Outside the library, Riven knocks gently on the door. The princess calls out that he can enter, and the heavy door creaks slowly. The princess is sitting with a book in her hands, she brightly says hello to Riven and hopes that he isn't working himself too hard. Riven blushes slightly and responds he isn't. The lesson begins and the princess teaches Riven how to write. She was worried she might not be good at teaching so she's surprised that their lesson is going smoothly. She mentally notes that he might even be smarter than her younger sister. She smiles as she watches Riven and finds it amusing how he wanted to learn how to write her name first rather than his own. The princess reaches out to touch Riven's hand, reminding him to relax when writing. Riven's face flushes red at the sudden contact as he meekly says yes. Marion suddenly enters the room. She apologizes for the intrusion but an important letter had just arrived. As she hands the letter to the princess, Marion jokingly tells Riven that his handwriting looks like adorable little worms. Looking at the letter, the princess recognizes the seal. The seal is from Edith Magnolia, Shalia A. Aunt and trusted advisor. Shalia reads the letter. My dearest princess. In the letter Edith expresses that she heard the princess was in an accident and thus suggests she regain her physical and mental state in a relaxed environment, rather than remaining cooped up in the castle. She invites the princess to stay with her this summer. That way they can also discuss her upcoming debutante ball. Edith finishes her letter, I miss you dearly, your loving aunt Edith. P.S. I have the gondola you loved as a child all fixed up for you. Listening to the letter, Marion exclaims that Lady Edith has always been so thoughtful of the princess. But Shalia is quiet and wary. She recalls that in the novel she was one of the few people that supported Shalia. We get a flashback of the novel. Princess Shalia is with Edith. Her hands are on the princess's shoulder as if shaking her to wake up. Edith exclaims that Shalia mustn't allow Eclet to take away Tezric, her brother and the crown. She announces that she is the only person the princess can trust and they will do whatever it takes, even murder. The current princess grasps the letter tightly as she recalls this scene. Edith allowed Shalia's mind to fester despicable thoughts and was also a villain only second to the princess. Although she doesn't want to meet her aunt, just in case the woman is planning something, the princess will just have to see. Looking into the distance, she invites Riven to go for a gondola ride. Elsewhere, a resounding slap fills the air. We see a woman with crimson red hair clutching her equally red cheeks. An older woman with light brown hair tied in a bun, has her hand in the air while she tells the red-haired woman that she is a nuisance. She proceeds to chastise the younger woman, and asks her to recite what she did wrong. The younger woman with long flowing crimson hair and silver eyes looks at the floor. She cautiously clutches her hands in front of her, her cheeks still swelling red. What a bully. 
As expected, Tesseract's big ego is bruised. Now he has to look for that necklace if he wants Shealia to meet him. I hope Precious Riven grows out of his shell later on. Let's continue. Chapter 10 Back in the room Eclat touches the red welt on her cheeks. She explains that she still has plenty of things to learn about etiquette and manners, so doesn't feel ready to enter society yet. She doesn't feel confident enough to attend an event by such an important individual. The older woman, her mother, sighs and tells her to just be quiet and listen to her. The invitation is from Madame Edith Magnolia, the Queen of High Society. Her mother, now riled up, raises her voice and exclaims that this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity and a chance for her to find a proper suitor. How dare she talk back when this is all for her benefit? Unable to say anything, Eclat is quiet. Finally in a low voice she apologizes. The mother turns around, orders the younger woman to start packing, and leaves the room. Eclat is left alone in the room, her cheek still red and a tears falling from her eyes. The slam of the door is cold. Back at the princess castle, they are discussing preparations for their journey. The princess finds it comical how Marion suggested they bring an entire unit of knights to escort them. Marion explains that their journey is quite far and they must prepare for anything to come. Riven, standing beside Marion, nods his head in agreement. The princess gives her counter-argument. She retorts that moving in a large group will only draw unwanted attention suggesting that someone important is traveling. Riven, listening to the princess' words, again nods his head in agreement. What a cutie. The princess finalizes that the purpose of their journey is rest and relaxation so she wants to travel without any fuss. Marion accepts the princess's decision. She and Riven leave the room to prepare for tea. The princess sitting by the window, heaves a sigh of relief. Her flowing yellow sundress trails on the floor beneath. The reason for the small castle and the woods and few servants is because Marion is a worrier. She notes that after getting sick and recovering, not once did the emperor visit her. I could disappear and he wouldn't look for me. But then again I'm not his real daughter. She leans her head against the window and thinks that perhaps this is for the best as she could never be comfortable with him around. All she wants is to draw little attention, meet with Edith and quietly return home. It is now the day of their journey. And, Susan and Grace with bowed heads, see the princess off. They wish her a safe journey with Riven and Marion. The princess assures them that she will soon return. In the carriage, the princess thinks of Edith. She wonders what she will be like outside of the novel. She wonders if Edith was truly genuine in inviting her with recovery in mind. Soon she will arrive at her destination and find out for herself. The princess looks out from inside the carriage, and sees a monumental mansion loom over her. She steps out of the carriage and is welcomed by the butler of the household. Heels clack on the ground as Edith comes forward to welcome her personally. The woman exclaims, excited at Shalia's arrival. My princess! Look at how much you've grown! She dotes on her niece. Shalia is nervous as Edith approaches her with wide arms. Together, the two women share a hug surrounded by the rose flowers in the garden. Inside the mansion, Edith informs them not to hesitate if they need anything. As much as she wants to catch up with Shalia, she will show her to her room so the princess can rest. As the group walks along the hallway, Edith turns around and looks at Riven, she states that the boy with the white hair is so handsome, and flashes a wide grin. Riven is confused at the sudden compliment. Edith asks him whether there was something going on between him and the princess, which Riven immediately shuts down as he wouldn't dare. Shalia is thinking to herself that Edith will be a handful in the coming three days. But for some reason, the princess can't see her as a villainess. They finally stop and in front of them is a wide door. Marion recognizes the room and Edith tells her that yes, it is the room of Shalia's mother. She continues that she secretly planned a special event just for the princess. This is the first time the princess heard of an event, and asks what her aunt is talking about. At the same time she hears mumbling coming from outside. She peeks out the window and sees the butler talking to an older madam. The butler states that her invitation was only for one person, 
but the madam explains that her daughter refused to attend unless she came along. She turns her head to her daughter for backup, and the woman with red hair meekly responds yes mother. The butler accepts their explanation and ushers them inside. Edith repeats that she planned an event for her as Shalia's wide eyes continue to watch the women outside. From outside, the woman with red hair notices someone is on the second floor and looks up at her. The two women finally meet. But what is Edith planning? So suspicious. Anyway. Chapter 11 Princess Shalia looks at the women below. She notes how the one with the red hair looks young, maybe around her age. She wonders why there are other guests at her aunt's mansion. At this moment the red-haired woman below looks up at Shalia. The two women lock eye to eye, and it sends the princess into a panic. As if by instinct, Shalia turns away from the window and hides behind the wall, her heart beating against her chest. She asks herself why she suddenly reacted that way her body moved on its own. Edith suddenly speaks, she says that she wanted to keep it a secret, but might as well let Shalia know that she is holding an event. With a bright smile she explains that she wanted to give Shalia a chance to make more friends. The princess is not keen on the idea. With a blank expression on her face she says that while it was nice to see Edith, she will have to leave soon. Edith jokingly grabs the princess asking her where she's going. Shalia begins to ask about the girl earlier, but her aunt cuts her off and retorts that it's girls, not girl. Edith did not just invite one girl, but she invited several. The princess gasps, it's like the soul in her body just left. Her aunt happily exclaims that the more the merrier. Shalia feels blindsided by this sudden event, but Edith reassured her that this is a great opportunity for her. With a single invite all these ladies are willing to come for the sake of their families and the opportunity to debut in high society. With searching eyes, she continues that maybe one of them will be a girl willing to die for Shalia. In her head Shalia wonders, Edith's plan isn't for making new friends. It's for collecting pieces for her chessboard. Exhausted, the princess crawls to her bed. She doesn't know what Edith is planning, but it seems she's doing whatever she can for Shalia to strengthen her position. Frustrated, she continues that this is supposed to be about relaxing, why is suddenly part of a high society gathering. She doesn't believe she can get friends here. Their relationships will fizzle eventually. Sitting up on her bed, she notices the portrait of Shalia's mother in front of her. The woman in the portrait has light brown hair, features she didn't pass down on her daughter. If only Shalia looked like her mother, maybe the emperor would have shown her affection. She closes her eyes, and corrects herself that having an absent parent is never the child's fault. The next morning, the sun is shining bright. Edith, sitting in the drawing room, convinces Shalia to just enjoy, drink tea and chat. Shalia is preparing herself for tea time with the other guests. The princess replies that she can't guarantee that she'll make new friends. Her aunt reassures her that it won't be her fault, but the ladies for not meeting the princess's standards. She continues that none of the guests know about her identity as the princess and that it's her choice if she wants to reveal her true identity or not. Shalia prefers this as it lessens pressure for her. She leaves the room and Riven wishes her to have fun and to be careful. She jokingly replies that she will claim victory. As she walks out the room, a worried Marion calls out and asks the princess not to fight anyone. The princess walks to the tea room. While she doesn't like this event, it was prepared by her aunt so she will just make an appearance and leave quickly. The doors to the tea room open, and Princess Shalia walks in. The room is filled with other young ladies. Shalia feels intimidated and debates whether or not she should introduce herself. They look around the same age as her sister. What do ladies around her age talk about? The women run to her and grab her hand. The chatter around the princess asking her when did she arrive? Should they sit down for some tea? Why did they gather around like this? Shalia is pleasantly surprised at the reception of the women. She thought this was going to be awful, but the atmosphere is normal. The women sit around, and they talk about a lady that hasn't shown up yet. They relate to the woman who stayed in her room to get more rest. 
Perhaps she only used this event to get out of the house and get relief from the pressures of getting married. Shalia drinks her tea as she listens to the women talk. These ladies are already pressured to marry at such a young age. Just then someone enters the room. The woman with red hair nervously introduces herself. The ladies offer her to have a seat while Shalia watches them. This woman is the one from last night. Shalia asks her for her name and the woman replies, my name is Eclet. The princess sips her tea calmly as she repeats the woman's words in her head. Then it clicks. She spits out the tea into her cup as she realizes who this woman in front of her was. Eclet offers her handkerchief while the princess has a mental crisis. Surely this is a coincidence right? They just have the same name. The princess dabs the tea from her mouth and asks Eclet if she knows about the Arecibo convent. Eclet is surprised, she states that the convent is where she was born, but how did Shalia know? This isn't just a coincidence for Shalia anymore. She thought she would recognize Eclet as soon as she saw her, and she wasn't expecting to meet the main character here, like this. What is she doing here? Shalia exclaims. She gets up from her seat, and Shalia shouts that Eclet shouldn't be here right now. Eclet is surprised at Shalia's sudden words, speechless. The other ladies watching now mumble to themselves, wondering what's happening. Shalia looks at Eclet with fear etched on her face. Eclet should be at the convent right now so she can meet Tezric. Looks like we strayed from the original novel already. But let's be real. Shaley is shouting at Eclet to leave the moment they meet. Is textbook villain behavior, anyway? Chapter 12 We see a flashback of Eclet at the convent. Surrounded by children, they ask her if she could show them one more time. Curious, a nun passing by asks them what they are doing and the children exclaim excitedly that Eclet can do something cool. With the nun's eyes on her, Eclet explains that it's not something special. As sparkles of light come from her hands, she explains that this was something she could do since she saved Hans in the forest. Her face full of focus, Eclet commands a swirl of bright light that filled the air around her and formed in her hands. She didn't say anything before since she couldn't control it anyway. The nun with wide eyes, watches the magic unfold in front of her. The nun runs away in fear. At night in the convent, two nuns are discussing what just happened earlier. This sort of witchcraft had never happened in the convent before. They have to report it to the heads of the church. Eclet might get summoned to the capital because of her abilities. The nuns discuss reaching out to high nobility families who would pay handsomely to have a witch in their family. And that was how Eclet met her generous benefactor, Tezric. We are back to the present, and Shalia is standing with fear and worry etched on her face. The other ladies are now crowding them asking if they knew each other. Shalia comes to her senses and realizes that she acted strangely in front of all these women. In a bid to escape, she runs out of the room. The other women exclaim that perhaps they should end it for the day, they leave the room while a dejected and confused looking Eclet sits alone on the couch. Back in her bedroom Shalia is exhausted. She recalls her body instinctively hiding the moment she locked eyes with Eclet. It was probably her body's survival mechanism. She can't believe she just met the one person she wanted to avoid as much as possible. And the way she treated Eclet was a classic villain thing to do. She sits up and immediately tells herself she will apologize to Eclet before the woman has her head cut off. But the princess can't help but be scared of Eclet, and wonders if she should even involve herself or not. Her name is Eclet Blanche. But she didn't have a surname in the novel. Was she born of nobility here? Something is different again, and Shalia has to figure that out. The next day Princess Shalia approaches Edith to ask how she chose the guests of this gathering. Edith explains that while there weren't any strict standards, she only invited those who approached her with a goal in mind. She will accommodate these young ladies as long as they are honest with their intentions. Some of these ladies are also forced by their families, for example Eclet. The princess is taken aback that her aunt mentioned Eclet. Edith explains that she heard that Shalia stormed out with anger from the tea room yesterday. Shalia flinches and explains that wasn't the case. 
Her aunt continues that Eclette Blanche is an orphan from the convent. She was adopted by the Baron Blanche and his wife a few months ago. Shalia wasn't expecting that. She asks herself at what point did the novel shift so much from the original story? How will things end up this way? Shalia clasps her hands in front of her. But no matter, there isn't anything she can do. Edith smirks knowingly, she states that the Blanche family is clearly trying to get Eclette to marry up in society. They are trying to sell Eclette off to a rich family and claim new fortunes for themselves, Edith continues that the family as a younger son, but the sudden amount of information overloads Shalia. Are you listening? Edith asks. Shalia quickly says yes, but her head is still clouded with thoughts. She wonders if all the other ladies gathered here are also going to be in arranged marriages. Will Shalia also be sold off? While she's worried about Eclette, surely as the main character she will work it all out, right? Shalia seethes with anger, she can't believe that the main character is being treated this way. When her sister wrote the perfect male lead for her. Just then one of the guests bursts inside the room. She has fear etched on her face as she calls for Edith's help. Edith asks her what the problem is. The woman, named Lala, is clearly worried and panicking. She shouts that the others are in danger and there is something strange in the mansion. Obviously the novel shifted as soon as new Shaley arrived. I mean she's been changing things left and right since the start. Maybe Tesseric was busy looking for that necklace. So he couldn't go to the convent. Anyway. Chapter 13 Edith tells Lala to calm down. She confidently states that there is no danger in her home. But Lala doesn't budge and continues that she definitely knows what she saw. She exclaims that she wasn't the only one who saw it and the other ladies are in grave danger. Shalia watches the woman, confused. Her heart thumps as she wonders if there are any legendary creatures around them. Lala finally shouts that she saw a crone. This revelation stuns the princess, and Edith gives out a giggle. Shalia asks her aunt if she knows where Riven is. Edith explains that Riven asked her for permission to pick some apples from the garden, so she allowed him to do so. In the garden, Riven drops an apple on the ground. Confused, he calmly asks the two women in front of him to let him through. The two women look at him with eyes of contempt. The lady in a ponytail demands him to explain who he is. She states she's never seen a crone like him move with such confidence. The other woman accuses him of escaping from the dungeon. Riven looks down on the floor and begins to explain that he came here with Shalia, but he stutters. He struggles to use the right words to say and fails. Because of this, the women decide they will attack him. Just then Shalia walks up to them. She demands the women put their fists down. She stands in front of Riven and puts an arm out to defend him. She states that he is one of her servants. The women stare at the princess, confused that her servant is a crone. Shalia gets chills from their stares. She is afraid of what these women might do. She had no idea when Lala said danger, she meant Riven and herself. One of the women speaks out. She says that there are plenty of eyes here and so Shalia shouldn't let her servant walk around by himself. The princess is annoyed, she states that she is a guest here as much as the woman is and adds that hopefully these women don't treat their servants unkindly like this. Eclette approaches them with an apple in her hands. She asks if everything is alright and hopes that they aren't fighting. She smiles at them and kindly suggests that everyone calm down and get inside before rain comes. Silence falls on the group. The two women take Eclette's advice and leave. Eclette looks at Riven and hands him the apple that he dropped. As the two talk, Shalia watches them in awe of Eclette. The way she treats Riven is just like a cliché. Just like in every novel, the main heroine shows kindness to the person everyone else sneers at. This moment is where she demonstrates her kindness. Shalia is stunned, yet impressed at how things worked out for the main character Eclette. Suddenly an older woman arrives. Eclette's mother calls out to her angrily. Eclette panics, and the woman loudly asks her to follow her this instant. Shalia watches them leave, 
and as they walk away the mother turns around and glares at the princess. So this is the woman that is trying to sell off Eclat, she thinks. Riven and the princess decide to go back inside the mansion as raindrops lightly fall from the sky. Inside the castle, a sad Riven apologizes to Shalia. He never meant for her to get caught up in that earlier, all because he wanted to walk off by himself. The princess, clutching an apple, exclaims that it's not Riven's fault. He believes it's his fault that the princess isn't gaining any friends in this social event, and is now all alone in the room. Riven hangs his head, his thoughts full of gloom as the princess tries to reassure him that it's not on him. She continues that she can make friends, she just doesn't want to and would just rather relax. She ends her explanation, but stating once the weather gets better they will go out and ride the gondola. But before they leave, she has to apologize to Eclat first since they might never see each other again. There is a knock on the door and the princess and Riven think it is probably Marion. Riven opens the door and Eclat steps inside. She is apologetic for suddenly intruding unannounced but she wanted to speak to Shalia. Wait a minute. Isn't Eclat's eyes supposed to be gold like the goddess Asonia? But then Shalia isn't saying anything, that's kinda odd. But anyway... Chapter 14 Eclat stutters, then with gentle eyes finally speaks out that there is something she wanted to ask. Shalia, now holding a book, looks at the woman nervously. In her head she has a mental dilemma on what Eclat could possibly ask her. Then she tells herself to relax. Now calm and regal, Shalia stands up to greet Eclat and asks politely what she wanted. Eclat looks at the floor and stutters, softly she asks if they have seen her younger brother. She continues that he is a little boy with brown hair. They are worried since it's dinner but they still can't find the boy. Shalia watches Eclat, surprised as she didn't even know Eclat had a brother in the first place. She finds it surprising that Baroness Blanche would even bring her only son here. Eclat takes out a red bead. She explains that this is part of the bracelet her brother Alec wore. Riven looks at the bead and senses a string of energy coming from it. Hearing this, Shalia tries to offer and help look around for the boy as well but is physically unable to utter the words. Fortunately, Riven steps up and speaks on behalf of the princess and states that he can help look for the lost child. Taken aback, Eclat exclaims that there is no need as the maids are already helping them look for the child. She nervously continues that until her brother is found it might be best for Riven to stay here for now, as her mother is already suspicious of him. Listening to her words, Riven is disappointed. He recalls an urban legend about crones and how they kidnap children during rainy days. Eclat explains that she is only worried about what her mother would do if she sees Riven walking around. Shalia notes that Eclat did have a character of being completely blunt and honest. Hurriedly, Eclat announces that she has to leave and look for her brother, but before that nervously asks Shalia if they met before. Shalia states that it would be impossible and Eclat embarrassedly looks down and agrees. While impossible, the way Shalia acted during tea time was strange. But Eclat stops herself from speaking further and heads out to look for her brother. As soon as she leaves, Shalia tells herself that they will leave as soon as the rain stops, but before that they will help look for the young boy first. The princess and Riven head out of the room to help look for the boy. The rain outside continues to pour as they look around the halls of the castle. The maids have already searched the upstairs, and the child couldn't be out in the rain right? His mother will surely scold him once he's been found, Shalia states. Curiously, Riven finds a red bead similar to the one Eclat showed them earlier. He picks up the item and explains that it is a protection charm and so it emits a small magical light. While it's not well made, it would have been expensive so his parents really care for him. Hearing this, Shalia couldn't help but wonder how this boy received so much love, yet Eclat will just be sold off. While annoyed, she reminds herself that it's none of her business. Curious, she asks Riven how he knows this when he previously said he couldn't do magic. Riven explains that while he can't do magic, he can see magical traces. He continues that the best way they can find Alec is to follow the traces from the magical charm. The two follow the magical string and end up in front of a wide door. They are about to enter, worried if the boy is doing okay, 
when a voice shouts from behind them. Baroness Blanche is demanding to know what the both of them are doing. They look at her surprised, while the older woman repeats her question. Shalia responds that they heard about the missing child and came to help. The woman cuts Shalia off and angrily notes how she decided to bring her crone with her. Riven flinches, as the woman stares him down, when suddenly Eclat rushes towards them. Mother! She exclaims. Fidgeting, Eclat suggests that her mother should rest and she will look for Alec herself. She stops herself mid-speech as she notices Shalia and Riven were there. The mother is quiet, she takes a step forward and raises her hand. And a slap fills the air. Wow, this lady is just truly horrible. Chapter 15 Baroness Blanche lifts her hand and Shalia immediately extends both arms to protect Riven. Confused, Shalia sees the Baroness slap her own daughter. The older woman shouts at her daughter admonishing her for not being able to properly look after her brother. If you're really worried you should be looking for him right now, she angrily shouts. The woman stops her tirade, saying there's no time for this and she should be searching for her son top to bottom. Suddenly the little boy comes from outside the door. Mommy? The child asks. His mother immediately rushes to the child, her voice filled with fear and concern. She dotes on her son, as the child explains that he fell asleep while hiding. Meanwhile, a worried Shalia asks Eclet if she's okay, and the woman begins to leave with her child. Shalia turns around to call out the Baroness for slapping her daughter but is stopped by someone. Eclet pulls Shalia's arm in an attempt to stop her. The woman meekly apologizes for stopping the princess. Looking at the floor, she makes excuses for her mother. She claims that is just sensitive when it comes to her brother. Eclet states that she will inform everyone else that the boy has been found and that the princess and Riven can go to their rooms and rest. She doesn't forget to thank the both of them for their help. Shalia listens to Eclet, her face concerned. She feels worried about Eclet the most. We see Eclet with her mother in their private quarters. Both women are wearing night dresses to prepare for sleep. The Baroness is walking around the room frustrated at the weather. I wish to leave this place as soon as possible. She rants. Before she dismisses Eclet to go to bed, the mother quietly apologizes for what she did earlier. She claims that she didn't mean it, but surely Eclet understands that. Eclet looks at her mother's back, stunned at the sudden apology. She hurriedly replies that of course she understands and adds that she'll see her mother in the morning. She closes the door behind her and leans against it. Heart thumping and face blushing, she smiles to herself. She only has to try harder a little bit more and she'll be accepted. Then they can become a real family. The next morning heavy rains still cloud above them. Marion enters the princess's room and sees the princess didn't attend the tea party again. The princess argues that she is having tea by herself right now. Marion informs her that the other ladies have gathered already, and Shalia is surprised that they gathered so soon despite what happened yesterday. Marion explains that it's hard to tell if the ladies are having tea or taking a nap as everyone was frantically looking for Alec the night before. Marion nervously asks if the princess is okay. Shalia looks at Marion with her tired eyes, speechless. Marion continues that the princess didn't need to go out looking for the boy and should have left it to Marion and the other staff. The princess recalls last night's ordeal. Seeing Eclet get slapped in front of her kept her awake at night. She still can't understand how someone can treat the main character just like that. That woman will be the first one to go if she keeps at it. She wonders if the villain changed to the wicked stepmother and step-siblings, something that's common in fairy tales. She recalls her role in the novel and how it could have easily been her who slaps Eclet, but she couldn't possibly imagine doing that. Riven and Marion watch the princess get lost in her thoughts again, their faces filled with concern. Marion breaks the silence and states that the house is in uproar, and that perhaps the continuous rain is partly to blame. She hopes the rain will stop soon. Elsewhere, Edith is in agreement with someone. She calmly answers, I accept. This affair could be beneficial for both of us. 
Baroness Blanche meekly asks if the idea is good. They are talking about Eclette's marriageable traits. Edith continues that Eclette is at a prime age, and her red hair is surely valuable. But before they continue their conversation, Edith clarifies if this is what Eclette wants as well. Without a beat, the Baroness replies that as Eclette's mother she knows what her daughter wants the most. The woman closes her eyes and hurriedly calls Eclette over. Eclette gently steps into the room and repeats that she will follow her mother's orders. Edith takes this as confirmation. She beckons the Baroness to have a seat and they can look at potential suitors while they have tea. Edith informs Eclette to have fun while she's still in the mansion because as soon as the young woman leaves, she will be busy with marriage preparations. If you enjoyed this video leave a like, comment and subscribe. And don't forget to ring that bell if you want to get updates. Thanks for watching and see you guys next time.